what I want to do is sort of start with a little bit of a, a recap of, of the basics of uh, Vince Scherhoff. So the, uh, the photo you can see there on the left is Vince in the late 1960s. He's at this point in his 70s. He's retired uh, from uh, an aluminium company in Oxfordshire uh, where he'd been uh, fairly important within their sales department. And uh, he and his wife having you know, a, a very good, a very good uh, retirement, spending a lot of time going away on cruises, um, foreign holidays, uh, you know, so all, all very good. However, in the... Uh, at, towards the end of 1967, his, his wife became quite ill and they knew that for the following year they were not going to be able to travel. And it seems that at this point, based on, on what, what Vince recorded, uh, is that his wife, I think, was a bit concerned. I mean, you can see the garden was in pretty good shape by this stage. Um, and I think she wanted him to have something to focus on other than the fact that she was, she was ill. So she persuaded him uh, she knew of the existence, I think, pr presumably of, of his uh, First World War diaries. And so she persuaded him to start the process of uh, transcribing and typing up his uh, First World War diaries. Um, and of course, that's, that's him there on the right-hand side at the time when he is uh, an interpreter operator in the Royal Engineers Signal Service. So over the next seven or eight months, uh, from the uh, Christmas of 1967, Vince... Uh, does a great job. He, he, he takes his diary, uh, it's uh, typed up. I, having, <laughs> having retranscribed it myself, it's uh, 200,000 words. And he then sort of, well, what do I do with it? So he, he's got this thing in, in full scale folders, he's, uh, sorry, in ring binders, he's got um, various um, uh, photographs and, and memorabilia and ephemera that he's got with it. And he approaches the Imperial War Museum um, and the Imperial War Museum decide that they're going to capture this on the fantastic new medium of the future called microfilm. Because once you get to the 2020s, the whole world will be using microfilm as their main, uh, their main storage, storage means. So uh, the, the Imperial War Museum uh, digitise it, oh, sorry, digitise it, uh, microfilm it, and... Uh, Vince, I think, you know, feel, from, from, from the interaction with, the, uh, with, their, with the, uh, the Imperial War Museum at the time, I think he sort of feels that he has, you know, he's done his bit for history, he's deposited uh, his uh, material in the Imperial War Museum. Later on, uh, after his death, um, in the early 1980s, uh, the family also uh, loan the uh, folders to the, what was then the Intelligence Corps Museum in... Um, uh, in Ashford in Kent and uh, although they didn't take a copy at that time they did actually uh, take some notes and it was it was used um, you know as by by one of the uh, one of the people in the museum uh, to to sort of you know inform displays that sort of thing and then later on in the uh, in the in the um, uh, sort of the late 2000s the intelligence corps museum became the military intelligence museum and again the family because they live relatively close to it lent a copy to the, to the museum, and the then archivist looked at it, wasn't quite sure. Some of the stuff didn't sort of make sense. As, you know, this guy was not from the intelligence corps, so it wasn't, didn't really fit. Um, but uh, Joyce, the archivist, made the decision to get the family's permission to make a photocopy. Um, and then a few years later, uh, I was working in the archives there, and Joyce said to me, have you seen the Vince Scherhoff diary? And I said, the what? And she handed it over to me, which started a process which resulted in this book. So here's the sort of the very, very quick um, summary of Vince. So he's born uh, Fritz Vincent Scherhoff in Birmingham. Um, and when he joins the army, he says to everyone, don't call me Fritz, call me Vince. Um, his father was a naturalized German immigrant who ran a small manufacturing business with his brother. Uh, Vince worked for the family firm, and he is living in Birmingham suburbs. The family have servants. He's living a sort of fairly comfortable middle-class existence. He joins um, in October 1914. He joins uh, one of the local, locally raised uh, infantry battalions, and about a year later, he's then deployed with that battalion to France. 
He spends six months in the trenches uh, with the battalion, um, and then because he speaks fluent German, he ends up being transferred into intelligence work for the rest of the war. And he is a pretty good intelligence soldier. Uh, the, the very, very strong evidence that he's definitely above average, not just getting promoted, uh, but also sort of testimonials from his employing officers that are, that are pretty glowing. Um, and also getting the military medal for his actions on the 21st of March 1918, where he keeps the uh, intercept station running uh, until the very, very last safe moment, uh, and, and then gets his, gets his team out with the equipment. Uh, rather than being overrun by the Germans. So he is primarily involved in uh, signals intelligence, so in a dugout with a headset on listening to German telephone messages, um, but he's also employed in uh, interrogating prisoners, handling prisoners, processing prisoners um, as well, and also sometimes sort of general intelligence duties. So that's the sort of the, 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 the sort of the, the, the general context and, and where where you can find more uh, should should you want it. So this is basically the sort of the and I can go back to this if you want to at the end and talk about the process by which you're actually listening in to the German signals over the other side. Right. So today, what I want to do, I can't talk about everything about Vince's off-duty life because it is of course multi-dimensional. So what I'm going to do is talk about his engagement with entertainment in various forms, and then, uh, as I promised at the end, talk a little bit about uh, his, uh, some of the highlights of, uh, of him in relation to, to food. And one of the things about the sort of the off-duty life, and, and, and I'm sure this won't, won't come as a, a surprise to this audience, is certain aspects of Vince's life on the Western Front are probably, on reflection, quite positive. I mean, there's some really, really grim things happen, um, and, you know, to him and to his comrades. Um, but, you know, during the periods where it's not awful, actually he has a re pretty reasonable time. Um, he's in his early 20s. He, if we think about him uh, you know, pre-war, he's in quite a confined social context, you know, middle class, uh, middle class, uh, middle class England, um, certain sort of uh, standards of behavior, not a great deal of sort of opportunities for sort of having, having, having wild living. I mean, you know, he's, 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 we know that he's involved in music at uh, home. We know he plays uh, plays tennis, he's a member of the tennis club, you know, he has, a, he has a social life in Birmingham, but the sort of, and this is something which, again, I'm not sure is entirely uh, explored in a, lot of, in a lot of histories, is the sort of the sense of freedom which these young men are being given beyond the sort of the social constraints that you would find yourself in before 1914. And, and you know, part of that as well, if we then think about the sort of the social, uh, the social change, that occurs after the First World War, to what extent is that you know, men who have gone off and had a lot more freedom than they would have done before coming back and are not willing to sort of put, on, put back on the, sort of the, 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 the social straitjacket of, of their past. So what's good about the diary is in terms of his, um, uh, his, his, his engagement with forms of entertainment is that he records a lot and he also records not just you know I went to the cinema but what he went to see uh, he gives sort of reviews of what he well, you know short reviews of what he's seen he talks about uh, in relation to the concert party I mean uh, the concert parties seem to be very marmite for him he either loves them or he hates them um, but you know they they as long as they're cheap it doesn't 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 matter too much the other thing which is which which jumped out at me and this was this was something which came when I was sort of pulling, pulling this together a, a while back, was that actually live music outside the context of concert parties was also really quite important. Um, and again, this is, this is something, I'll, 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 as I'll flag up later on, this is something that has, sub since, since Vince Diary came out, this is something that has had more, uh, uh, more, more coverage um, and I think is something that we potentially underestimated in the past about just how much the sort of the, not just the sort of the knockabout of uh, concert parties, 
but actually high, you know, reasonably high quality musical performances were pretty important, particularly to that sort of that strata of sort of middle class, other ranks and middle class soldiers. So, right, moving on. So that's, that's, that's basically what I'm going to cover. Um, I've just before, before I do that, I want to sort of divert into a couple of other areas that I want to flag up, but I'm not going to unpack. So, that's Vince's war. <laughs> Now, this, this, is, this, is, this is going to require a little bit of explaining. So, uh, you can see uh, we've got 1916, 1917, 1918, and a very, very small part of 1915 at the beginning. So, each square is a day of his war, and essentially from his deployment to France through to the armistice. And the... Bits in red are where he is in the trench system. The bits in green, those are the bits where he is in the rear areas in some respect. And you can see also the uh, periods that he has, uh, the two periods that he has of leave. And I've also put the little triangle there because that's the point at which he switches from being in the infantry to being in intelligence work. Now, he, he doesn't leave the infantry until later on that year. Because for, for, for most of 1916, his official status is infantry soldier seconded to intelligence or attached to the intelligence. Um, he then transfers later, later that year into the, into the Royal Engineers Signal Service. So for the sort of first six months up until the Triangle, he is, as you would expect, leading that itinerant lifestyle of the infantry battalions. They, you know, they are moving from one part of the Western Front to the other, often marching quite long distances, sometimes uh, getting trains. And he doesn't connect. This is something which, which is really quite clear in comparison to his time in intelligence. His opportunities to connect with his surroundings, be that his sort of the civilian surroundings or the sort of the military infrastructure that is, that is provided are much less when you're in the infantry because you're constantly on the move. You are, you are, you are this, 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 this constantly fluid movement of uh, soldiers. So you, know, you're, you, you may start to get to know the, uh, the people that you are billeted on. You may start to frequent the cinema that is just down the road, but then Three days later, bang, everybody move. You know, we're going to a completely separate part of the Western Front. Now, what happens when he transfers to intelligence is intelligent soldiers are also shunted around, but Vince gets quite lucky in that his battalion is in the Arras area when he moves across to intelligence. And the, uh, the intelligence signals intelligence uh, work is uh, basically organized at core level. The corps are static, or at least the, uh, the British corps are static on the Western Front. And so he finds himself in, a, in the same place for a long period of time. Now, later on in the war, this is a, this is a deliberate choice on the part of when you're doing this with intelligence personnel because you want your intelligence personnel to understand the target that is in front of you. So if you are, if you are somebody with the headset on or if you are somebody who is examining air photographs, having a continuity within a localised area means that you're going to be able to pick up nuances that the new guy isn't because they're not familiar with the area. So Vince is in the Arras area. He then, at Christmas 1916, uh, is sent away to essentially be trained as a signaller and sort of his status within the Royal Engineer Signal Service to be, uh, to be formalised. And it would appear, again, reading back from, from the evidence, that his employing officer asked for him back. So there's, there's, there's this, essentially the, 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 this system is improvised in, in the summer of 1916 from whatever German speakers you have locally uh, in the battalions, the infantry battalions that just happen to be there. And then uh, what we can see in other, in, for the case of others is once you've had this sort of training process, they're then scattered out to other parts of the Western Front. But in Vince's case, we, it, it would appear that his employing officer really rates him and so asks for him back to be a, uh, a commander of a, a listening station detachment. So what that means is Vince then spends pretty much the rest of the war 
in and around the Arras area, which allows him to get to know the surroundings really well, both the sort of the military infrastructure and also the civilian infrastructure. Now, as you're going to see in a minute, uh, there are some times when he is accessing entertainment opportunities when he should be in the trenches. Now, this is, this is, this is, a, this is a function of the nature of where these listening stations are. So you, if you think about the sort of the broad trench system, it tends that these listening stations are at the back of the trench system, at the very worst in the sort of the middle. And uh, because they are doing quite long rotations within those uh, st stations, they, and they have the sort of, if you like, the sort of secret squirrel pass, which allows them to get past the military police, um, they are able, and they have legitimate reasons as well for resupply, etc., to sort of, okay, I'm not on shift with the headset on, I'm not needed to maintain the lines. Actually, as long as I'm back in time to do my midnight shift, then I can go back, I can go to, you know, have a drink and something to eat in, in, a, uh, in an estaminet or something which is nearby, or I can go and catch the show which is, which is in town. So, so there is a, there's also a sort of freedom of movement and a degree of trust on the part of their employing officers uh, that, that gives them there. So also these, these soldiers have more opportunity to engage with the, uh, with the entertainment opportunities. So then we get to uh, the uh, sort of April, May of uh, 1917, and Vince is then taken out of the listening stations and becomes one of the prisoner handlers uh, for, the, um, for the Arras offensive, essentially. Initially, he is in the process of, you know, huge numbers of German prisoners. Who are they screening them? Okay, who are the ones that are most likely uh, that we want to sort of channel off for particular interrogation? Um, and that then morphs after the offensive dies down to they, they just become general intelligence dogs bodies within the, uh, within the Arras uh, area. And what we see in that summer of 1917 is Vince wanting to get back into the, tr into the trenches, but his team, who he leads, are really quite enjoying the lifestyle. And we see within the diary that he makes a deliberate choice not to request to go back to the uh, listening stations because he knows that his team will have to go with him and his team want to stay out to the trenches, whereas he wants to go back into them. Um, and then uh, back uh, over the winter, sustained periods back in the listening stations, and then after the 21st of March 1918, when his listening station is overrun, uh, he then goes back into prisoner uh, work, although at that point he is then uh, part of uh, the medical system and he's part of the, uh, the, the hospital chain, and it's his job to go and interrogate uh, wounded German prisoners um, and also to manage the process of when you put in a decoy wounded German prisoner next to, in a bed next to a wounded German prisoner in order to get information from them. Um, so that's, that's, his, that's his war. Now, if we, if we exclude the, the, the leave periods, he spends just over a 1,000 days on the Western Front, and the breakdown between the red and the green is 40% of his time in the trenches and 60% in the rear areas. And that, if we, again, there's been recent work done with, with war diaries. That, that sort of is reasonably comparable uh, to, to, to other, uh, other areas. Now, the other thing I would sort of stress is the importance, and I'll, I'll sort of... Uh, I won't dwell on this because this is, this is something we can potentially talk about in, in, in questions, is the real importance of the comrade. You know, so he, there is the immediate context of the signals intelligence personnel that he is working with. You know, and, and they are in very, very tight proximity with one another in claustrophobic circumstances. And yeah, as you can imagine, tensions rise, particularly when you're, when you're stuck in, uh, in the dugout for a long period. And you naturally will socialize with them and take in entertainment opportunities with them when you're out of the line. But there's another group which they interact with, which we see in this picture. So the, the, um, uh, the, the guys, the, the one wearing the German helmet and the one at the front with the pipe, they are intelligence policemen. And they are working on counter-espionage. So they don't, they don't have anything to do with the signals intelligence work. But they naturally, when they're out of the line, the, the soldiers that they naturally gravitate towards in order to socialize with, other than their immediate circle, are the intelligence policemen. 
And partly it's about similarity of background. The recruitment of the intelligence, person, intelligence police is similar to the interpreter operators. But I think as well, it's, you can go and get drunk with them and it doesn't matter if you talk about work accidentally because they're also in the secret world. Um, and uh, so this is, this is again, I'm, sorry, I'm, going to be talk, I'm going to be talking about you know, Vince, Vince accessing entertainment opportunities in his off-duty life, but he's not, he, very rarely is he doing that on his own. It's, you know, it's, it, 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 and again, you, you also see in the diary where he will bump into uh, maybe somebody from his old infantry battalion and you know, either you go for a drink or you go for a drink and go to the concert party. It's, sort of, it's, it's that sort of very, it's, very, uh, it's very much a group activity rather than just uh, an individual one. However, there is one off-duty thing that Vince is very much doing on his own and that is reading lots and lots of novels. Now... This was something which, when I, when I first transcribed the diary, I, I, obviously I noticed that you know, he was mentioning books. But there were so many other things going on in the diary that I, I'll be honest, it, sort of, it was sort of, you know, number, <laughs> priority number nine or whatever it was. And it was John Bourne who, who I, I sort of gave the edited typescript to um, and, uh, to get a sort of second opinion on it about getting it published. And uh, I met John for a drink uh, a few weeks later, and, and John sort of looked me in the eye and said, whatever you do, don't take out the novels. And, and, uh, and I sort of looked at him and he said, he said you, in terms of getting inside the mental world of that middle-class soldier and his form of escapism, and one of those forms of escapism very much and it's time alone, it's time individually focused on something, is novels. Now, I'm, I'm not an English literature specialist, but from the little work that I have done in terms of looking, looking up the background, this is, this is very much mid-range literature of the period. Um, and he, you know, the, the, it, it's also sort of talks to the fact that, again, you, you know that some divisions have libraries. Um, and and I, 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 my, my sense is that this is an area that hasn't necessarily been fully explored. Um, and and it, it, for me, it struck, what really struck me is that there's this period, particularly towards the end of the war in the 100 days, when, when Vince is working on his own uh, in the hospital system. He's socialising with the medics, he's socialising with the, with the units that are around him. But his, his default becomes find yourself somewhere to sleep, make it, uh, bl black it out, because at this point there's lots of restrictions about uh, blackouts in order for air raids, and then you know, get your candle, get your bar of chocolate, and then just sit down and concentrate on a novel and just take yourself away uh, from, 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 from the Western Front. I mean, and, and he talks also about the sort of, even when the air raids are going on, you know, he still just sort of keeps, keeps reading his books and, uh, and carries on. Okay, so I, I'm gonna flag that. I'm, I, I, this is, this is it's an area, it's a really, really interesting area. I, I'm not qualified to, 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 to explore it further, but hopefully somebody will in the future with obviously a broader sample than just Vince. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about cinema. Um, Vince speaks fluent German. He also speaks fluent French. So we also know from the diary that he, he attends the army provided films, but he also sometimes goes along to the local French cinemas um, and, and watch it there. Now, of course, this, you know, this, given that we're, these are silent movies, um, but obviously for the, you know, the French version, I'm, I'm assuming that the French versions, the sort of the, the, words, the words appear in French, um, and therefore uh, maybe other, other soldiers were also doing this, but, but for Vince, there is, no, there is no language barrier, even though they are silent movies. So he, I don't think he records all of his cinema attendances, um, because particularly in 1918, there's a long period in the summer of 1918 where he's in one place and there's a, there's a French cinema nearby, and I think it becomes just part of the, part of the routine uh, every time they get a new film in that they go in. He doesn't necessarily recall all of them. But if we uh, take the mentions, there are 41 cinema attendances, um, and also that he's on the Western Front for nine months before he steps into a cinema. Um, now, 
Is that, and I don't know the answer to this, is this because actually the army cinema provision doesn't get going until late 1916? Or is that because he is living that itinerant life of the infantry soldier away from the, uh, away from the, um, uh, the sort of the, more away from towns and infrastructure than, than, than others? There are, as I say, clusters we can see, uh, as I mentioned, in the summer of 1918 when he's, he's quite a way back in the medical system where, again, more cinemas are, are available to him. Um, and we, but we also see in the summer of, 1970, uh, summer of 1917 where, and these are, these are the army cinemas he's going to, and this is, this is interesting because he is in the area which the soldiers refer to as the desert. So this is the old Somme battlefields that the Germans withdraw from and destroy everything. And therefore, the only thing that is there is what the army has taken into the area. Um, and what is clear is the army takes the cinema facilities into that area. And I'm, I, would, I, would, I'm sort of, you know, I would sort of suggest that therefore that is quite an important part of you know, keeping, keeping the troops uh, occupied and amused uh, in, in an area where there aren't uh, other entertainment options. Um, in terms of his reactions to uh, the cinema, um, there's a few when he names them and, and where I've been able to sort of find, find the movie poster. Um, so uh, again, this, this one here, and then these two here, good film sport by bad light. Uh, Douglas Fairbanks, he doesn't give us a, a review of. But what's interesting here from the other two, from, from May 1917 and also from June 1918, is this, I think, attests to the popularity of, of this. You know, this is, this is you, you know, you, you, you're, you're, they're turning them away. Uh, you know, guys, guys are struggling to, to, to get into this. So again, uh, it's an area which I would like to know more about. I know that there have been uh, some, some studies done. Uh, but I think again, this is this is this is this is something which is which is clearly very popular. Now I think I'll come I'll come on to the concert parties at the moment. But we have tended to think about the concert parties as as the sort of default entertainment. I wonder to what extent actually the cinemas are, are at least on a on a par with that. Okay. Um, so moving now to the concert parties. Now, Vince's infantry battalion, um, for various reasons which I haven't got time to unpack, in December 1915, his infantry battalion is switched divisions. Um, so they come, they come to France with one division, and then they are switched to a regular division uh, whose uh, concert party is the whiz -bangs. And they, uh, as a regular division, had formed, they're one of the ones who formed their concert party really early, so they form it in, the, in autumn 1915. And again, what, what, what struck me is, as, I, I suppose it shouldn't have surprised me, but, but when, when, when I was going through it, it, it did. We sort of imagine that, again, as, as again we're thinking about the infantry, the infantry battalions moving around, obviously the division moves around and the division takes its concert party with them. Um, and and obviously, if you're in that division, you're probably going to get a bit fed up of seeing the same acts all the time. So what we see is the sort of the, the cross-fertilization, the crossing of the paths. Once, once the number of concert parties hits a critical mass, in any one area at any one time, you are going to have multiple concert parties. Um, and so the ones on the right are the others that Vince goes to uh, during the war. Um, and again, these are, these are associated with uh, and, and I know that th th there has been a lot of work done on the concert parties, and particularly in terms of codifying uh, which divisions that they are they are associated with. So uh, again, he's he's a good source on this. He's 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 going to a lot. He's he's sampling uh, across the piece rather than just going to the going to the whiz bangs over and over again. Um, he uh, he also uh, goes to uh, so there's also Lena Ashwell concerts. He goes to one of those. Um, and also interesting, there's, there's one which is the, uh, where are they, the uh, Bow Bells? Yeah, the Bow Bells. Interesting, the Bow Bells were considered a sort of a crack or elite concert party, really, really good show. And you had to book your tickets a week in advance if you wanted to go and see them. Um, so, you know, this is, this is, this is, this is, whereas I think with the cinema, it's just 
rock up, you see what's on. You know, the, the, this is this is something which is which is which is which is much more varied. Um, so if we then repeat the method and overlay when he is going to concert parties, and again uh, we we can see here in the in the win in the, in the uh, winter of 1970. This is actually when he's in the listening station is actually in, in Arras. It's in the trench system on the edge of Arras. So actually, he's able to come in, and particularly where they're using the, uh, the, uh, the sort of the larger buildings in Arras to house their concert parties. He, he literally only has to go half a mile away from the listening set in order to, uh, this is where, because the concert parties are pushed up right against the front line there. Um, so less, f fewer of them, uh, we see 30 recorded attendances. But the engagement starts earlier. Um, and again, that's during his time with the infantry, that's the whiz-bangs, that's, and others that, that, uh, that cross their path. Um, and Vince also um, talks about the, the fact that there are certain star performers that you will go back and see many times, uh, which, which I think is interesting. Um, his comments and reactions to the concert parties uh, this being uh, sort of the, the, the first three of them. Uh, first of all, the, I think I like the top one because it says something about it's an all ranks event. Whereas the cinema, I, I, you know, I'm not sure that the Major General would have, would have been at the front of the cinema. Um, this, is, this is a shared experience across, uh, across the ranks. The second one, it doesn't matter that it wasn't very good. You didn't have anything else to do this evening. Um, and it doesn't matter that it wasn't very good because you didn't have to pay a huge amount of money to get in to see it. But the third one, I think, is, is, is the most interesting of the three because that escapism that the uh, concert party is providing, in this quote here, it's not just about when you're in, you know, in, in, in the room watching the concert party, but actually the atmosphere and he's talking here about the atmosphere afterwards, but also presumably the atmosphere before. So it's, it's, part, it's, more, it's a broader experience than just, okay, I, you know, I step out of the room and I'm, I'm back to the war, that actually there is a sort of uh, a, 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 much, a much more sort of festive atmosphere surrounding, uh, surrounding them. Um, he also interacts uh, for various reasons. Sometimes it's a sort of through, through mutual friends. He actually you know, gets, either knows or gets to know some of the uh, performers. For the top one, and this is, of course, you know, much sort of debated about the sort of female impersonators in, in these concert parties. I, I think you know, he's clearly impressed by the illusion, but he's also very much remaining conscious that it is, that it is an illusion. Um, similarly, also, I think, with the, uh, uh, with the, the, the other two pieces there, with the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the sort of clearly one of the leading men there, I, I wonder the extent to which, you know, and whether, how, how this is known to the audience, presumably by word of mouth, the fact that the concert party leading man is out doing real soldiering also enhances the experience. That actually, you know, this is, this is not somebody who's living a sort of pampered lifestyle. This is actually somebody who is doing the same job as you and just happens to take a bit of time out in order to, to entertain, uh, entertain the truth. And then uh, this one as well, I can't resist putting this one in. I think with this one, this is sort of Vince's, the, res the residue of Vince's middle class morality. He's, he's clearly intrigued by this person, but also there's an air of disapproval um, as, 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 as well. So I, again, I, 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 yeah, I like that one. And then moving on, as I mentioned at the beginning, to uh, music. And this was something which, which when, I, when I did the book, I sort of, uh, it, it jumped out at me. We know that Vince played the piano. We know from uh, some of the sort of the asides that he makes in, in the diary, including some of the comments that, that, you, that I'm going to show you in a minute, that in his civilian life, he was somebody who was clearly quite regularly accessing uh, live musical performances. Now, what's, what's great uh, is that uh, since Vince's diary came out, uh, Emma Hanna has sort of published the book 
on uh, on the sort of the, the music music and and, and, the, and the British armed forces, and again, it very very much speaking to again, this is something that that ha we have you know again the sort of you know the concert parties are eye catching. We 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 know less about the seminar art, and up until the publication of this book, we also knew a lot less about the sort of the live musical performances. So, with these, these are limited in number. And very much towards the end of the war, very much when he's uh, in the, uh, in, very much in the sort of the rear areas there. Um, but there are hints in the diary that there are there are others, um, but we don't know the exact dates of when they when they occurred. Now he he sort of he 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 reviews uh, three of them positively. He reviews three of them uh, negatively. Uh, I'm just going to run you through from the diary uh, some of his observations uh, about this. I, this. This one, I think, is almost poetic. So for this one, it's that, that link to the seaside holidays. The, the, the music... Uh, I mean, I don't want to overdo this, but, but the music is providing that bridge to you know, the safe, fun world before the war. Which also then comes in and again with this next one, um, where he's deliberately talk he is consciously talking about this being very much like his experience of the uh, seaside seaside resort. And what's interesting with this one is uh, when when we look, yes, sometimes sometimes he is going with others to the musical performances. But it would also appear that when he goes to the live musical performance, it's something which he does more on his own. Um, and so this is, you know, you can just <coughs> go to the thing, close your eyes, get away from the war, and link back to your, to your pre-war world, pre world. Okay. Um, if we then lay these over one another... With uh, obviously with the green bits being the uh, again this 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 one brings out more clearly the the, the, the fact that when you're in Arras, uh, you get more more opportunities to access concert parties. Um, I think it's quite it's quite important in terms of frequency, and I'll and I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, you know, uh, there are different contexts for him outside the line, but. In all of those different contexts, and you know, sometimes he's in Arras, quite up close to the front line. Sometimes he's in rear areas. Sometimes he's even further back. But that provision of entertainment in the three forms that I've talked about there um, is consistent, and his engagement with it is also consistent. Now, the problem, you know, the problem we've got, of course, is that Vince represents that 1914 group within the army, those, you know, those middle-class men who stepped forward in the first wave, and he gives us their voice. Um, obviously, he's not, he, he's, he can't speak for the later waves of conscripts, et cetera. So, so I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I fully recognize that, that he, he, he doesn't tell us everything we need to know about this, but I think he is a useful representative of that particular grouping. Um, similarly, also, He's a single voice, and, and again, I, I hope that in the future uh, he will be used by others who will go and, uh, go and explore these things there. So if we then take that and, and sort of try and sort of bring some sort of summary to it. So on average, in the period when he's outside the trenches, he is accessing some form of those three entertainments once a week, and that breaks down roughly as cinema every fortnight, concert party almost once a month, and a musical event every couple of months. And, and, and that is the conservative estimate, because, like, because as I said when we were talking about cinema, when he's settled in a particular area and he gets into a routine, he doesn't mention every time, everything he does in, in a particular day. So that's, that's at a minimum. The likelihood is that, that it, the figure is actually higher. Um, we can come back to those uh, in questions. What I want to do now is the, is the, is the bonus material related to food. And uh, again, I, Rachel, who I collaborated with on the article, has, has written the, the definitive book 
on the British Army and, and, and food in the First World War. Uh, very, very strongly uh, recommend it. Uh, it's you know, f packed with, uh, it, it's, one of, it's one of those books that I, I got and, I, and I, it was something I didn't really have a, a particular interest in. I uh, was coming up to do the, 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 the Vince project and it was one of those ones you just sort of sat down and it just drew me in all the rich detail and sort of, you know, it, one, of the, one, of the, one of those sort of wow books uh, for me when, uh, for when, when I went through it. So Rachel being a food historian, primarily a food historian of, of the military and, and me being more of a sort of, you know, Commonwealth Garden military historian, it was quite interesting when we sort of collaborated because we're both looking at the same sources and we're seeing very, very different things. And it came, it came quite clear when I gave her this photograph to look at. So this is uh, Vince's battalion uh, while they're still in Birmingham, uh, wearing the, the Kitchener Blue uh, uniforms uh, before they sort of head off uh, to do sort of training under canvas. So this is prob probably taken around about sort of February, March 1915. And as a military historian, uh, I'm looking at this, and I know from Vince's diary that um, the, uh, the, the mess hall is quite crowded. Uh, you know, I know from other sources that they have to uh, eat their meals in shifts. And, and I sort of I looked at this, and, and uh, okay, it's, it's a group of soldiers. And, and again, I get sucked in. And I can, in Vince is right there in the, uh, in the middle. That's him there. I'm looking at the badges of rank, all the sort of things that military historians do. As a food historian, Rachel goes... Wow, look at all the leftovers. And again, if you look here on the right-hand side, the, the shift that's eaten before them has left a huge amount of food. Now, you know, theory number one, food was terrible, they didn't want to eat it. Or actually, the provision of the food, and again, we would, we would suggest probably from the, uh, from the, the testimony that the prince is giving, that there is actually quite a lot of it. It's not, it's not particularly appetizing, but, but there is more than enough uh, to sustain, particularly at this stage where they're not, uh, you know, it tends to be just drilling and marching rather than actually more, uh, more, more physically demanding stuff. And we also, know, I mean, again, it's the other stuff we, we, we think as, as well, the interesting little one from, from the diary, which is there's a real social issue here in that uh, these are primarily middle-class men from, from Birmingham. That's how the battalions were configured. They were meant to be recruited from Birmingham's middle classes. Um, and one of the things that really jars with them during this particular period is that they have to do fatigue duties in the sergeant's mess. And the sergeants of the battalion tend to be former regulars who have then gone out and become essentially security guards, sort of low status occupations within Birmingham. And then you find yourself in uniform and the social hierarchy is inverted. So you, the middle class person who would not, he, normally he would be opening the door for you, whereas now you're in the kitchen cleaning up after, after him. So there, again, all kinds of layers there. And again, this is, this is something which, which Rachel, because she's done so much more work on this, was able to sort of bring out a lot more of the nuances, particularly of the sort of the food being really, really important in terms of a, a sort of the shock factor of, um, of joining the army. So uh, this is the number of days in a month that Vince mentions food in his diary. So one of the things we did was just, just go back to the 200,000 200, word version and say, okay, when, when, whenever he mentions food. And what is interesting here, I think, is that 1916, food is more of an issue. Once you get out onto the Western Front, now that, again, there's lots of, you know, is this about this process of adjustment for Vince, or is there actually an issue where the food supply issues in the army are more problematic in 1916, and by 1917, 1918, you've managed to sort of shake them out. So uh, what we also see as well uh, in the sort of the later part of 1916 is that a great deal more personal agency in that uh, Vince and his comrades decide they're going to start cooking for themselves rather than uh, take, it from the, take the food from the local infantry battalion when they're in the front lines, they will actually get the raw rations and they will cook them for themselves. Now, the classic cliche, of course, is that you, know, you, you, you get off the boat and in France and you spend the next three years eating bully beef and biscuits. Um, and, uh, of course, that's, that's not right, although bully beef and biscuits are, uh, you know, are, are, are there as the, sort of the, 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 the meal of last resort. Um, but 
one of the one of the problems, and, and this is something which 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 Rachel and one of the again one of those sort of wow things within the book, is what Rachel talks about is a lot of what we know about food in the First World War comes from memoirs, either you know the memoir literature or from the sort of the stuff that's, that's sort of captured and recorded in the late sixties, um, the oral history stuff as well, and she makes the case that that quite a lot of the comments about food you can see this as a, as a way of expressing your discontent with military life without being appeared to be sort of unpatriotic or whatever. So, you know, you can complain about the sergeant major, that's okay. You can complain about the food, that's okay. But you can't really sort of complain and say, well, actually, I didn't really want to go to war. So, 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 so the, 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 you know, the poor quality food becomes, or in, instances of poor quality food, become a proxy for wider discontent with what you did during the war. So what were soldiers eating? In theory, that's sort of, you know, the soldier's uh, sort of standard daily ration. Um, what was it in reality? So if we, if we take Vince's diary and we take every single mention of every food type that he does within the 200,000 words, we can actually start to break out the diet and break out the frequency. Now, again, you know, there are, there are certain foods here which, because they are so common, they don't get mentioned very often. But we can, we can sort of see here, uh, you know, particularly uh, the, 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 the prevalence of bacon, okay, within, with, again, no, no sort of surprise there. But also eggs. And this is something from Rachel's work where even in the memoir sources, and again, the diaries and letters, that actually eggs are considered quite a sort of precious uh, food and a special sort of food and again partly because of their fragility so you've, you've got to really look after them but actually having you know being able to cook an egg in, a, in is, is a sort of a link back to sort of home cooking um, and again here uh, potatoes no surprise there but also the amount of confectionery chocolate etc and one of the one of the things that we see particularly in 1970 uh, 1916 is Vince getting lots of parcels from his family and mentioning at great length the content of these parcels. And unsurprisingly, confectionery, chocolates, sweets, all these sorts of things are frequently within these, uh, within these parcels. They drop off in 1917, 1918. And, I, and, and what we see there, I think, is a shift whereby Vince is telling his family, don't send me parcels, send me money. Because actually, he's got better access to the, uh, the sort of French food economy, and therefore cash is a better way of getting a variety of things. Whereas when you're, particularly when you're living that itinerant infantry lifestyle, uh, you need the food parcel because you're not necessarily getting access to the French sweet swap. Drinks, again, a bit like the bully beef and biscuits, uh, well, it was all just tea and rum. Well, actually, I was, I was a little bit surprised. Uh, you know, cocoa, Horlicks, both mentioned by, uh, by Vince coffee. Now, that could be skewed by Vince having a preference for coffee because of his German heritage. Uh, that, that could be an explanatory factor in there. Uh, but particularly cocoa, and particularly cocoa, hot cocoa uh, at night is, is, a, is a big thing when you're in the, uh, in the listening stations doing your work uh, for Vince. Again, I think it's because, because of the, uh, the, you know, the additional sugar uh, is, is, good for, is good for him. And again, a fair balance there. Cider also makes a bit of an appearance, but not enough to, to put onto there. This is the dog that doesn't bark in Vince's diary. There are only a couple of mentions of rum, and both of them are for his time with the infantry. Once he's out the infantry, no mention of rum whatsoever. Alcohol consumption, um, again, Similar picture to uh, the, the food in that we have lots and lots more mentions. Um, however, I think this is also affected by the fact that in the uh, late summer and autumn of 1916, his group are not very well regulated and so are spending a lot more time in bars, including when they are in the trenches. So again, with the secret squirrel pass, you can go, I'm not on till midnight, I can go and have a few drinks and you know an egg and chips um, and there's a couple of instances where again Vince records that actually you know things were a bit fuzzy uh, when he put the headset on um, so uh, yeah so so uh, things become more tightly regulated after that but also the fact that 
you know, shifting from, uh, again, we don't know how much he's consuming alcohol he's consuming before the war, but I can imagine probably not a great, not as much as he does during the war. And there are also some quite epic moments of binge drinking with him and his colleagues, particularly on sort of high days and holidays and when people get promoted and that sort of thing. But again, I, I, I don't want to sort of labour that one. Also, where the food and drink is being consumed. Now, this is the sort of, you know, the classic, the classic painting of the, of the estaminet. This is sort of you know, what's also clear, and again, this was this is what was really helpful in terms of working with Rachel is that actually there is a hierarchy. You have the low-level estaminets, which are sort of very much sort of the improvised uh, alcohol provision, f quite often quite close to the front. But we then have the family-run cafes, the restaurants, etc., which the ordinary Tommy is not necessarily going to feel that comfortable going into because again there is there is more of a, more of a language barrier. But Vince, because he is fluent in French and because he is in the same places for long periods of time, starts to build relationships with certain cafe owners and becomes one of the regulars. This is uh, his record of, uh, this, is in, this is one of the ones near Arras. So Vince is the only non-Frenchman at that lunch. Um, I'm sort of the, uh, the, the, in the rest of the diary talks about the, the, the participants of people, uh, of Frenchmen who are running the railways, that sort of thing, etc. I just want to sort of draw, draw this together and I, and I just want to sort of flag up two, two sort of really, really good books on, on this. First of all, there is this, there's been a long discussion about the extent to which what soldiers are being provided for in their off-duty life, the extent to which that sustains their morale. And you know, the, you know, part of the reason why you rotate troops through the trenches and bring them out and bring them to rest is allow them to recuperate and, and recover their morale. And, and, um, and this is happening on both sides of the line. And, and a lot of what w you know, we know about uh, this is, of course, driven by uh, British sources. But similar things are happening on the German side of the line. The German army is also trying to sustain the morale of its soldiers in similar ways. And, uh, uh, Alexander Watson's book is really good at sort of bringing those sort of two things together and, and putting, them, putting them side by side. The other book, and again, this is, this is one that's not, not particularly well known by, by Craig Gibson, a, a Canadian historian, where he unpacks in a broad way all of the interactions between the British army and the local French population and makes, you know, the, the sort of, the, 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 I suppose, the capstone point that Part of the reason why the BEF is able to keep its morale together is the presence of the civilians. You have a friendly civilian population, so when you are coming out of the line, you are, that greatly eases the process of recovery, what you're doing in your downtime, in your off-duty. Um, and this is perhaps something which, which has, up until... Uh, Craig Gibson did his book is something that perhaps we sort of instinctively knew but but he makes it explicit and does the various ways it does that's me my understanding is we now have a break and then Q&A after that Oh.